right. So. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode here on the channel. I'm your host, Gabriel Garcia, always known as the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe. Welcome to episode two of the Historian's Lounge second season. Now, today I am joined with a guest that needs no introduction. He is the most prominent military commander of the uh, 19th century and early or late 18th century. He is a battlefield genius. He rose from the ranks. He is a man who is ascribed by his enemies as the god of war. <laughs> Joining us all the way on this virtual communication is Napoleon Bonaparte, His Excellency himself. Merci, monsieur. Permettez-moi de me présenter. Je suis Napoléon Bonaparte, l'empereur des Français, roi d'Italie, protecteur de la Confédération du Rhin, etc., etc. Et c'est vraiment un grand plaisir et honneur de vous voir aujourd'hui. Pardonnez-moi. <laughs> Forgive me. How quickly I forget that your viewers do not always study their French. <laughs> I shall endeavor to speak to you in English this day. You are correct, my friend. My name is Napoleon Bonaparte. I am the Emperor of the French, the King of Italy, the Protector of the Confederation of the Rhine, etc., etc. And it truly is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, I understand very recently there was a play about you by an actor by the name of Joaquin Phoenix, and it details your entire life. And I just want to take this opportunity to discuss with you whether or not the play is accurate to your uh, upbringing. So let's actually start from um, the beginning in the early parts of the film where we see Joaquin Phoenix portraying you during the height of the French Revolution. Did you feel that that accurately portrayed your rise in the military and the world around you, Your Excellency? Well, uh, as you call this play, this film, indeed, I did view it upon a screen, which I found the technology quite amazing, most impressive. But I felt that this said play did not get all the facts correctly. Mm -hmm. Starting with uh, the film, uh, it had me portrayed by Joaquin Phoenix uh, viewing the death of the Queen, Marie Antoinette, of which I was not present for the execution of the Queen by the guillotine. So I felt that that was uh, perhaps acceptable to put in to show the importance uh, of that moment in the history of the revolution and France. And of course, I would hear of the news of the death of the Queen. Uh, and of course, prior to that, the death of the King already. Some of the personages that were present in that uh, scene upon the play uh, were Paul Barra, who was an integral part of the French government at that time before the Directoire, and uh, also my brother. So as to those personages who were present, that was correct. But as to me viewing the death of the Queen, I did not witness it. Fascinating. Fascinating. Now, many people tend to look at your life towards the later years of the grand battles from Austerlitz, Egypt, and the many battles, so forth. But no one really understands the beginnings, which I think all great commanders start somewhere. So when the film shows you getting into the nitty gritty, to use a term, did you feel that that accurately shows your rise as a soldier and did it actually portray your fellow Frenchmen in the same respect? An excellent question. What I uh, discovered from this said film is that uh, it did not show my full rise. It did not show my time at the military academies at Autun as a young boy, at Brienne, and then at Ecole Militaire, where I received my commission as a sous-lieutenant, a second lieutenant in the French artillery. 
Once the revolution, and that would be 1786, the revolution begins in 1789, and you really do not meet my character of Napoleon uh, until 1793, um, when they start the film with the execution of the queen. They immediately go to a room with Paul Barat, my brother Joseph, and myself, in which they are speaking about Toulon and how it needs to be taken. I was but a captain in the French army at that time. The decision for me to take command of the artillery at the siege of Toulon did not take place in Paris. But mm. rather, I was escorting a convoy of supplies in the south of France, close to Toulon, to the city of Nice. It is while I was there that I met the commander of the French forces besieging Toulon, which is a port city on the Mediterranean Sea in the south of France. And there, General Corteau uh, told me that his artillery commander had been wounded and was unable to take part. I explained to him that if he put me in command of the artillery there and made me a general officer, then I would take the fortress city of Toulon. He agreed. I immediately began to create my plans for the seizure of Toulon, knowing that I would have to take several earthen fortifications that the English, uh, the Spanish, and the Royalists had erected around Toulon. Mm. The chief of them was Fort Mulgrave. Now, the film did portray me getting very, very involved. In fact, many of the French officers during the actual siege said Bonaparte was always present. And when he needed to rest, he typically just covered himself with his cloak and placed himself underneath a piece of artillery. So I was always present, trying to set an example for the soldiers I had the honor and privilege to command. Uh, so that is somewhat shown in the film. There was um, an oddity in this said film in which mm. they showed the casting of special types of cannon that were going to be used and the discussion of a type of artillery shell called hot shot, which was excellent against ships in which it could uh, set them aflame or right. perhaps destroy their magazine where the black powder is to be found or set their uh, sails aflame. Uh, this was bizarre for we did not uh, create these smaller versions of the cannon. We simply used the cannons that were already present at Toulon that were being used by the English to fire upon their ships. But prior to that, it is true that I was able to acquire hundreds of pieces of artillery from the local region to be used to create new, what we call batteries. A battery is about six to eight cannon of different sizes, meaning the size of the shot they will fire. Oh, correct. upon the enemy. And I named each one of the batteries. Uh, in fact, one of the batteries that was closest to the enemy's position uh, was the battery uh, des hommes sans peur, uh, of men without fear. For only the men who were without fear could be able to man that with their courage against the enemy shot being fired in their direction. And that is where I would meet that man called Juno, who plays a prominent role in the play. Fascinating, fascinating. Now, in the beginnings of the movie, especially in the, as we say, the trailers to entice people to the play, it depicts, or at least the actor is taking liberties with your depiction of how the rest of the French military and the aristocracy views you. In the film, it sort of makes you out as this underdog, kind of despised figure who is rising through the ranks, this nobody, and yet somehow he portrays this level of confidence that gathers others to his um, cause. In fact, one scene in the trailer shows you or, you or Joaquin Phoenix as you in a room with men pointing rifles at his opponent. Now, I understand that um, you, of course, had a I wouldn't say difficult childhood, but definitely a very complex childhood. So can you tell the um, viewers about your upbringing and if that is accurately portrayed or at least accurately referenced in this play? 
Uh, well, they really did not uh, depict my upbringing. Uh, I am one of eight children, the second born. My elder brother Joseph, myself, uh, Lucien, Louis, uh, Jerome, and my brothers, Alisa, Pauline, uh, are, are my sisters. And um, I think uh, not all of them were portrayed in the course of the film uh, as a result of that. My upbringing was not necessarily difficult. I grew up on the island of Corsica, which had been okay. acquired by the French under Louis XV in 1768, and I was born August the 15th of 1769. And um, thus, by one year, I was French. And that is how my father, Charles Bonaparte, was able to send myself and my brother Joseph to France to attend military academies at Auton, Brienne, and uh, finally École Militaire uh, as a result of that. So I always wanted to be a soldier. I spent mm. much of my time at the Casa Bonaparte, at the House of Bonaparte in Ajaccio, uh, reading books, sometimes not even coming down for dinner. But it would be at a young age of nine that I would be sent off to France, to Autun, in reality, to learn French <laughs> before <laughs> I would learn my studies uh, as becoming a soldier. Uh, so none of that was really talked about or was even... Um, uh, depicted upon the stage in this said film. Interesting. Fascinating. So now let's jump forward a few years into your life in this film. So you're now already a very powerful man in the military at your current rank, and then you meet her. You meet Josephine, a very, very lovely woman and a very powerful woman, which for those who know, she was very very powerful in like your inner circle in your life at that point. Um, what about the interaction between you two? Was that accurate um, to your own life or were there some liberties taken? Oh, absolutely. There were many liberties taken as a result. Now, my beloved Josephine, uh, Rose Taché de la Bagerie, uh, she in truth was born on Martinique. So we were both island born, myself on Corsica, her in Martinique. Uh, Trois-Ilet uh, was the region or the place that she was from where her family uh, ran a plantation there, a sugar plantation. Uh, but she had been married prior to meeting me to a man named Alexander de Beauharnais, and they had two children together, uh, Eugène and Hortense. Uh, but when the revolution, of course, began, uh, and Alexander de Beauharnais became part of the revolutionary government and a general officer, he uh, was sent to the guillotine for failing at the siege of Mayence. Uh, so thus, um, they were without their father. And Josephine, once the terror began in the French Revolution, with mm -hmm. the committees of public safety and men like Danton, Saint-Just, Marat, and the most famous Robespierre, she was sent uh, into prison, where no doubt if uh, Robespierre had not been overthrown, and they do depict this in the film, she would have been executed by the guillotine. Really? Yes. So all of those who were present, uh, whether it is at the, the temple or the conciergerie or the many other places where members of the aristocracy or those undesirables, as they were often referred to by the Republican government, would have been sent to the guillotine. But fortunately, Paul Berat would lead the Thermidorian reaction in July of 1794 and topple the government of Robespierre, establishing the directoire or the directory uh, of those five chief executives in the French uh, Republic. It would be about this time that I would meet Josephine. Now, her name was Rose, but Rose Joseph de la Pagerie. So when I met her, I wanted to call her by a name no one called her. So I simply took the Joseph and referred to her as Josephine. And now mm -hmm. all of history knows her as Josephine. Now, I had found success at the Siege of Toulon. I had been made a general. I went to Paris. There was a royalist uprising in which they tried to topple the government of Paul Berat in October of 1795, often referred to as the whiff of grape shot. And mm -hmm. I was tasked with uh, defending the Republic against these royalist soldiers. They were not soldiers, they were really a mob. And uh, it is there uh, that I found great success and saved the government. 
it was shortly thereafter that I would meet uh, Josephine at a ball, at a party that was held by Paul Barab. He was, uh, he frequently held such soirees in which all of society would be present. And that is where I first glimpsed Josephine and her beauty. I fell madly in love with her from the very start. Now, her son, Eugène, as was required, came to return the saber uh, of uh, his father, for it was expected that all citizens would turn in any weapons that they had. In the film, they show Eugène coming to meet with me in the hope that he could get his father's saber back. So it was in reverse. The reality was that uh, Eugène was coming to turn in his saber, but he wanted to keep it as a keepsake of his father. Um, someone would comment that uh, the young boy could not even draw a saber, for he was young at that time. And being that uh, I soon discovered that Eugène was a student of history, I asked of him, how did Alexander the Great untie the Gordian knot? And he responded in his knowledge of history. He said he cut it. He, uh, so I said to him, do not draw the saber from the scabbard, but draw the scabbard from the sword. And the young boy immediately was able to draw the saber. Mm. So thus, I think it might have been a ploy by Josephine to meet with me because I then in turn went to the home of Josephine and met with her and thus began our romance. We would meet on several occasions until I asked her to be my bride uh, and she agreed. So thus on March the 9th of 17 and 96, we would be married. Well, congratulations to you. Congratulations. <laughs> now you're in, excellent. In, in truth, it was uh, being that religion, unfortunately, in the uh, revolutionary government had been abolished. There was no church and there was no priest. But instead, the marriage ceremony was conducted by a clerk, being that I must admit I was two hours late for my marriage. <laughs> because I had just been given command of the army of Italy and I was looking over my, my maps with my officers. Once I realized my error, I immediately went to Josephine and we were married shortly thereafter. But the uh, lune de miel, as we call it in French, or the honeymoon, as you call it in English, was less than 48 hours for shortly thereafter, I was en route to Italy to take command. And I'm actually glad you brought up Italy, Your Excellency, because I actually had to go back out of the film to a book that I had read called The Generals by an author known as Simon Scoro, who writes about your exploits in Italy and eventually Egypt. And I honestly believe that it's probably the most important part of your military career. And I want to ask you, does the film accurately show that period of your life? The film does not show the campaign in Italy at all. Really? In reality, we go from my marriage of 1796 to Egypt, and they eliminate all of the Italian campaign, where this book over my shoulder are the letters of Napoleon to Josephine, many of them written during that Italian campaign of 1796 and 97. That is where I would receive my first general's uh, active command of an army uh, and where I would fight countless battles and formulate my strategies and tactics that would be so effective for me upon the battlefield. But unfortunately, they completely omitted that from the film. Really? They completely omitted the Italian campaign because, as you said, that is where you truly create your strategies and your brilliance, Your Excellency. That is a shocker. Do you think, in your opinion, the reason it is omitted is because Egypt, for the common man when thinking of Napoleon, is the most memorable in the sense that he is fighting against the Mameluk dynasty? Well, I would not imagine to uh, come up with a reason why the director uh, decided to, um, to omit the Italian campaign. I thought it is an integral part of the story, and it is an integral part of the relationship betwixt myself and Josephine. Uh, 
mm. but perhaps visually uh, it might be more stimulating for the guests, uh, those watching. Uh, they might find it a bit more interesting, or perhaps it is uh, an aspect of my career that many people are unfamiliar with. But regardless, when the play takes us to Egypt, uh, it immediately shows my forces displayed in line of battle and the pyramids in the distance and the Mameluk forces directly to my front. And it shows the actor portraying me, Joaquin Phoenix, ordering his cannons to fire at the pyramids at Giza. That is ridiculous. Nothing could have been further from the truth. I have been accused of blowing the nose off the Sphinx with my artillery. That never happened. It was done by the Ottoman Turks as early as the 17th century. And never, and I repeat, never did I fire upon the pyramids. What must be remembered is that my expedition to Egypt had about 35,000 soldiers, but amongst those soldiers were 150 savants, those that would make a study of Egypt, that would form the, uh, the base or the uh, platform or the foundation for what would later be called Egyptology. So there were scientists, there were botanists, there were artists, there were engineers, all doing a complete study of Egypt. Why on earth would I order my artillerymen to fire upon the ancient pyramids? And in truth, the Battle of the Pyramids, as we called it, was quite a few miles away from those pyramids at Giza. It was at Mbaba. And uh, that was indeed a great victory, showing that the discipline and the firepower of a Western army, most notably that of a French army, could easily defeat the antiquated Mameluke tactics and strategies uh, and weaponry, some of which were bows and arrows and axes and outdated muskets and cannons. So we made quick work of them. Fascinating. And would you agree, Your Excellency, that the success of the Battle of the Pyramids comes from the training and the battles from the Italian campaigns for your men? Uh, I would say that some of it came from that, but some of it just came from the tactics and strategy of the Western powers uh, of the day, of the use of brigade size, what we call squares, when your infantry is forming literally a square out of its soldiers, and then the equipment and the cavalry and the artillery can be placed uh, in the center, or the artillery often was placed in the corners to add to its defense. And being that the Mamelukes prided themselves on their horsemanship, and no one is taking anything away from their horsemanship, they were brilliant horsemen, but uh, when you form square, with your soldiers in three to five ranks deep with bayonets pointed outwards, the horse simply will not penetrate the square and thus your units will remain intact. And if you have a discipline, orderly firepower from your soldiers, they can typically fire three musket rounds per minute. It will make quick work of the Mamelukes as they make their charges towards your square. So uh, in, in that case, unfortunately, it was not depicted in the play. Uh, but it did show me defeating the enemy. Wow. Incredible. And, of course, going back to, um, again, the book, as I had to reference it, Your Excellency, uh, Generals, it's after the Battle of the Pyramids that, according to the author, and I had to check with the film, that there is a switch, as the author uses, that it's from the Battle of the Pyramids that you make the decision that, I have to be the one in charge. And that is, of course, according to the author and their own research. And in the film, I just felt that it seemed rushed, at least in my um, understanding. So for you, Excellency, can you help clarify um, how you decided that you were the one that needs to be in control of France to do what is best for the people? <laughs> Yes, the underlying theme of the film was that uh, I, every time I heard of Josephine, whether it be her infidelity or something was happening or I wanted to see her, I left what I was doing to return back to France to be with her. Well, that is once again ridiculous. One thing that they did get correct within the film 
is that my friend, Juno, who I had befriended at the siege of Toulon in 93 and 94, uh, had joined me on the expedition to Egypt. And it was he who informed me of the infidelity of uh, Josephine at that time with a French hussar, a cavalryman named Hippolyte Charles. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, this greatly upset me. It devastated me, to be sure. But I did not leave Egypt. Uh, from that moment, I would still have to take part in the Syrian campaign uh, with the fighting uh, in the Levant. Um, they are fighting all the way up to the northern part uh, of, uh, of Syria, known as the Siege of Acre. Uh, but I fought at Jaffa, I fought at Mount Tabor, there was a great campaign until I returned back to Egypt. And then I would receive information that the French government was not doing well. And it was time for a change. After all, the Directoire, headed by Paul Barra, had overthrown Robespierre and the convention. But now it was seen by the French people, their discontent uh, and the inability for the Directoire to properly rule France. So many felt that I could perhaps be that strong man to perform a coup d'etat. Being that the campaign was not going terribly well, I left it with one of my great subordinates, General Clébert, and I uh, returned back to France. Upon my return back to France, I soon discovered that this was quite an accurate assessment of the government of France at that time. And so I met with several of the notable uh, politicians, and it was decided that on the 9th of, and 10th of November, 1799, a coup d'etat, a seizure of government, would in fact take place. And I, as General Bonaparte, would be the strongman, being that I had the backing of the army. And uh, in the film, they do depict this coup d'etat. It was taking place at saint Cloud, so it was far removed from Paris. Uh, and uh, some of it was accurate, uh, the fact uh, that uh, there was a bit of hostility and it did not go immediately the way I had hoped for, but eventually it would be successful and I would be made first consul of the French Republic. Fascinating, incredible. And I especially love eventually the coronation scene where you kneel down and accept the crown. That shot in the whole play was just fascinating, beautiful. You held power. And it reminded me of that famous painting of you, Your Excellency, with you with the bauble and the scepter. And I know coronation scenes, we have records. So when that scene came up in the play, did that follow what exactly happened? Well, it did not follow exactly what happened, but they did get it somewhat correct. One thing you must know about the coronation, I performed my coup d'etat in 1799. I will not be uh, uh, elected to be emperor of the French until 1804. So nearly five years are going to pass before uh, this change will occur. And why do they want me to become emperor of the French? They want the longevity. They want... Uh, uh, me to be on equal par with the heads of state of Europe, whether it is the king in England or the emperor of Austria or the emperor of Russia or the king of Prussia. So I can be on equal standing with all of them as emperor of the French, as the true sovereign of the French people. So on May the 18th, 18 and 4, the Senate will vote for me to become emperor of the French, but the coronation will not take place until the 2nd of December, 1804. Mm. There was much discussion as to where this coronation should take place. Some felt it should be done at the ancient cathedral at Rheims, where all of the kings of France had been crowned. Some thought somewhere in Paris, uh, perhaps Saint-Denis. But I thought something new, something innovative, something where uh, none had seen uh, someone crowned before, and that was Notre Dame de Paris, which had fallen into disrepair. Uh, that mm. cathedral, of course, is found on the Ile de la Cité in the center of Paris. So I had much renovation done to it, and the coronation would take place on the 2nd of December. Now, I invited the Pope as a courtesy. Normally, the, co the Pope would crown you emperor, just as he crowned Charlemagne in 800 AD, Holy Roman Emperor in Rome. But I was going to crown myself, and this was known prior to the ceremony. 
Now, in truth, because Josephine and myself had not been married in the eyes of the church, the night before the coronation, we were in fact married in the eyes of the Catholic Church. So the, the Pope was much more pleased that it was a religious <laughs> ceremony as a result. But when the ceremony took place, and I thought it was depicted quite well, very much as you have said, my friend, mm -hmm. uh, like a great painting by Jacques-Louis David called Le Sac or the Coronation, uh, which is in the Musée Napoleon, or now it is called the Louvre. And many of the personages, the people who are present within that tableau, that picture, that painting, were those who were present there. And of course, the most pivotal moment was when I, well, of course, would crown myself, Napoleon, Emperor of the French, and then I would crown Josephine, which is immortalized throughout time uh, when I crown the Empress Josephine. Fascinating. And now we get into what I'd call the, the rise of the God of War, the Emperor of the World. And we see, of course, well, learn about your campaigns into Spain, where your brother Joseph is now a uh, king of Spain in a period during that era. And then, of course, we go eastward to against the the Austrian Empire. And there's one battle in particular that I did want um, clarification, Your Excellency. And it's actually been a hot topic or matter of discussion uh, within the community. And that's because the battle of, if I'm understanding correctly, Austerlitz, where Austerlitz. you are in the snow and there's a scene where your men are firing upon the Austrian army over this frozen lake and the lake sort of crumbles. Uh, one commenter or one historian talked to the director and said, was that accurate to what actually happened? And the director candidly responded, well, do you know what Napoleon did or how he went about? And a lot of us in the community kind of were upset by that because I would imagine you, Your Excellency, would have journals or records of all your major engagements that you partook. So. I would like for you to tell us about that battle and if it indeed go exactly as the film portrays. And if it didn't, what actually took place at that famous battle? With pleasure. The Battle of Austerlitz, noted to be my greatest victory of all my over 60 victories. So the Battle of Austerlitz was fought on the 2nd of December, 1805. So if you remember correctly, that is exactly one year after my coronation as mm -hmm. Emperor of the French. I had initially planned to invade England, but after the unfortunate news of the destruction of my fleet, as well as the Spanish fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar on 21 October, 1805, uh, I had to change my plans. So I took my army from uh, the northwestern corner of France and I marched it all the way across Europe in a lightning campaign to defeat the third coalition that was placed against me. And that would be the, the uh, Austrians and the Russians. So it was cold, but there was no snow upon the ground during the battle. So that is inaccurate when they show the, the snow, the blizzard-like conditions. I have fought battles in the snow before, most notably the Battle of Eilau that was fought on 7-8 February uh, in 1807, and that was fought in a snowstorm, but not Austerlitz. There were several aspects to this, uh, this, uh, this film that were inaccurate. One, they showed me dressed as a civilian. Uh, transporting some sort of donkey with wood uh, across the field as I spied upon the enemy's position. I never did such a thing. But what I did do before the battle is perform a personal reconnaissance of the enemy's position, but dressed as the emperor. And I did have an escort of soldiers. And I did come very close to the enemy's pickets, meaning their, their scouts, in which mm -hmm. uh, there was the possibility that I could have been taken, captured, or even killed as a result. But I did not dress myself as a civilian transporting a donkey with wood. That seemed absurd. Uh, so no snow. Uh, I did not dress as a civilian. And when the battle begins, uh, they show my, the French camp. 
and the tents. And it as if the battle was fought right by where the tents were. And that is also absurd. Rarely are you, go you are going to see a French camp set up with tents, but not all of the soldiers are going to utilize those tents. Many of them are going to use whatever buildings are available in the local area. Some will simply cover themselves with their cloak and sleep by a campfire as of course. a result. So this uh, was not a true depiction of when the battle began. When the soldiers advanced, and of course, uh, for Austerlitz, what was so miraculous about that engagement is that I was able to lure the enemy downwards from the Pratzen Heights and uh, inflict damage upon them from an envelopment, uh, a tactical uh, decision that was made. And they are not really showing that within the film. They show my men coming out of entrenchments, <laughs> of which we built no entrenchments as a result. And then they showed a column of the Austrians and the Russians advancing. What I found odd about that, uh, there were mixed units uh, together, uh, which is not custom for the Austrians or the Russians or any organized army at all. Uh, the way the soldiers were deployed with a small section of infantry and then cavalry right next to them and then some different infantry there. Uh, of mixed uniforms. It, mm. it seemed very sloppy as a result. Uh, and then as they advanced and I began to fire my artillery and then they showed the uncovering of the French cannons that eventually would fire upon the lakes. The lakes did exist and they were in the southernmost portion of the battlefield. Now it is true we did fire upon these lakes but we did not kill the amount of soldiers that was uh, depicted within this film. In fact, uh, I know of an archaeological study that would be done, and they would only uncover a handful of skeletal remains of both man as well as horses. Mm. So as to the carnage that is depicted upon the film, it is not accurate as to what actually happened other than it was a French victory, my greatest victory. Fascinating. I'm surprised that a lot of things were changed in this crowning battle for you, Your Excellency, because as you said, this is your greatest battle in your 60 years or 60 battles of fighting. So it seems like an interesting approach for the director to take such liberties. And then of course, History does go by, time goes by, and then we have the, of course, the expedition into Russia, which you had to make a tactical retreat away because your supplies were running low. It was winter time, and it's very, very dangerous for you and your men. And then all around you, your enemies are closing in on you. And... When I was looking at that part of the film, I was thinking to myself, they are rushing a lot of things. And I feel that they were trying to get to, of course, the iconic battle at Waterloo. Did you feel that the film um, missed a lot of important events in your life leading up to Waterloo? Things that we the viewers may have found important and have added context to certain scenes. Absolutely. So upon the conclusion of the scene of Austerlitz, uh, we move very quickly. Uh, yes, I will have a, a campaign against the Prussians uh, in 1806, defeating them at Jena and Auerstadt. I will fight against the Russians once again at the battles of Eilau and ultimately at the Battle of Friedland in 18 and 7. And that will lead to the Treaty of Tilsit. And they do show Tilsit, in which I meet with Tsar Alexander I. And we decide upon what is going to happen next. It is a very positive meeting betwixt him uh, and myself and in truth, uh, the King of Prussia as well. Uh, Spain will take place in 1808. Um, my second campaign against the Austrians, well, it's just really more than my second campaign, uh, but the, the coalition that's brought against me in the 1809 campaign in which I defeat the, the Austrians is not depicted at all. Uh, and also, they show the divorce betwixt myself and Empress Josephine in 1807, when in reality it did not occur until 1809. Why really? divorce Josephine? The reason that uh, Josephine and I had to divorce is that uh, she could no longer produce an heir 
to the throne. She had two children with her first husband, but for whatever reason, she could no longer have any children. And we needed to continue the line of the Bonaparte family. So thus, that is the reasoning behind uh, the divorce. So thus, by 18 and 10, I will marry again, Marie Louise, uh, the daughter uh, of, uh, of uh, the emperor of Austria. And a child will be born, Charles Napoleon, in 1811. And thus begins the 1812 campaign against Russia. But they don't really talk too much about why that campaign took place. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, Alexander was not abiding by what I called the continental system uh, or the Berlin decree that was created in 1806, in which all uh, European ports would be closed to England to hurt them economically. See, he had agreed to that, he being Alexander I in 1807, but he began going against that and trading with England. And so thus by 18 and 12, I gave him an ultimatum that he must stop trading with England or face going to war with me. And he chose to go to war with me. So yes, within that, uh, that scene in the film, they do show the difficulty of the campaign. Uh, in reality, uh, I had brought nearly 600,000 men into Russia. And logistically, it was such a challenge to feed them and provide for them. Many of them were new recruits. Not all of them were French. Many of them were of the German states of the now Confederation of the Rhine, the Italian states. Mm -hmm. and many were Polish. Uh, there were even some Spanish and Dutch regiments that were to be found there as well. Uh, so I had lost a tremendous amount of soldiers before we even reached Moscow. Now, the depiction of the Battle of Borodino, I found very odd. We in France call it the Battle of the Moscova, uh, and that was fought on the 6th and 7th of September, 18 and 12. And they show me leading a cavalry charge. <laughs> Nothing could have been further from the truth. I led no cavalry charges throughout the Napoleonic Wars, and I certainly did not at the bloodiest single day of the Napoleonic Wars at the Battle of Borodino. But that also shows me in the uniform that I had worn under the French Republic when I was a general de division. It was not even the accurate uniform that I was wearing. Really? Yes, which I found rather fascinating. Uh, but nonetheless, upon the conclusion of that Russian campaign, they immediately go to the abdication. And in reality, the abdication, my first abdication, the abdication did not occur until April of 18 and 14. And the Russian campaign will come to an end in December of 1812. So they do not show the German campaign uh, at Leipzig um, in October of 1813 or the campaign de France in 18 and 14. So uh, those were all omitted as well, making the viewer who is not familiar with my life or my campaigns. Uh, probably a bit confused. I was definitely confused. And I myself, of course, know very little of the Napoleonic Wars and, of course, the early French Wars of the late 1790s. But even still, we have documents. We have testimonies from the military commanders, from, of course, the men in your inner circle who I felt were highly underused in the film. There are so many powerful men um, in your inner circle, your excellency, that played immeasurable roles in the Italian campaigns, in the Egyptian campaigns, and I felt that they were very underused. They may be referenced, but if you don't know or if you're not a student of history, you will not know. So altogether with this film, do you feel that it accurately depicted your life or should have been divided into two parts. The play should have depicted your early rise to power and maybe ending with the Egyptian campaign. And the second play could have been all about your rise as emperor and the battles that took place. Well, that's a great question. So I, I, I do not think necessarily it would have to be put into multiple parts, though I think it would probably be give more clarity to the viewer if it was longer and the subjects could be uh, spoken about a bit more in depth uh, to give that clarity. Uh, but I think if it was uh, simply organized in such a fashion that you spoke of the most pivotal and important moments in my life, um, 
I, and it depends upon what the motivation for the director was. Did you want to create a piece of fiction based upon my life? Then that is fine. Then you can do whatever you like. And he certainly did. But if you want to make an accurate depiction of my life, well, then many errors were in fact made. I think we would need to ask the director what his motivation was. Did he simply want to make this piece of fiction based upon my life? Or did he want to make it a bit more accurate? Because there are moments within this film where he is depicting uh, accurately some aspects of my life and some moments in the history of my life and the interactions with myself and the Empress Josephine. I will applaud the actress uh, Vanessa Kirby in the role of the Empress. I thought she captured the nuances of the great Empress Josephine at moments during the film. Uh, so I uh, applaud her for that. But I think for, for clarity, uh, perhaps uh, the way in which it was laid out could have been done a bit differently uh, and more moments in my life could have been shared. You, you touched upon those personages that were not revealed, the Marichal de France, whether it be Marichal Davou or Marichal Ney or Marichal Murat, who played such an important uh, part in the creation of the Empire and throughout the Napoleonic legend. Mm -hmm. And we could see them there upon the screen if you were knowledgeable of who they were, but they never are called Marichal Ney or Marichal Murat or Marichal Davou. Uh, so that, that was a bit disappointing. Some of the other personages, Talleyrand, Fouché, are all depicted there. Uh, General Colancourt uh, was depicted there. Junot was depicted there. But many of the other important ones were not. And I thought that was a bit disappointing. Uh, but again, I, I, to answer your question very long-windedly, uh, I'm not sure if uh, a longer version would have been better and maybe given more clarity, or perhaps the way in which it was laid out could have made it a bit more accurate. Well, that is very unfortunate. I was looking. I had such high hopes for this film, this play, and talking with you, there was so many things taken out or altered or changed for the viewers. It's a shame because it is beautifully shot. It is so beautiful to see. But if you're trying to do a accurate depiction of one's life, you need to be truthful because the truth is sometimes better than fiction. And honestly, talking with your excellency and adding the clarity needed. I really want to see a proper Napoleon film. So thank you for that. Oh, indeed, my pleasure. I, I will say this. I am very thankful that this director, Monsieur Scott, took the time to make a film about my life. Even if it is not accurate, it is my hope, it is my wish that those who will watch this film will be inspired to learn more about my life, who will be able to pick up a book and to learn about uh, the true life of the Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and all of those personages who were depicted within the film to find out what is accurate and what is not. Uh, so I think that is perhaps uh, a call to action for those who will watch this said film. For I am a firm believer that all of the answers to the future can be found in the past if we study our history. And you are absolutely correct in that true life is much more is interesting than the fiction that will be created upon the screen. Well, thank you, Your Excellency. And thank you to our listeners who have joined us today. And before we end this wonderful discussion, Your Excellency, I would like to ask you, will you be visiting any places or part of any performances or visiting any places in the world where we can go and meet you and maybe meet others of the era? Absolutely. Uh, so I shall be taking part in the Great Battle of Znaim. Uh, which was part of the 1809 campaign uh, after Wagram, uh, fighting against the Austrians. Uh, and that will take place in the Czech Republic in July of this year. And of course, I will return to the famous battlefield at Austerlitz in December. 
uh, where uh, we shall once again recreate the greatest of my victories on the actual battlefield itself. So you can find out where I will be and what I am doing at Napoleon in America on my Instagram and that will reveal all of my events that I am taking part in and the personages who will join me. Excellent. I will link all of these down below in this video. Thank you all for joining us for this very wonderful episode. And again, a thanks to His Excellency, the Emperor of France, Mr. Napoleon Bonaparte. I want to thank you for providing your time and your insight into your life and allowing myself, a novice of French Napoleonic history, to understand. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And listeners, be on a lookout for future episodes coming out this week and later this month. And I will see you all very soon. And as always, this is the Wandering Scribe and the Wandering Quill signing off.